Yes, yes. Uh, so, uh, good afternoon, everyone. So, today we will be having uh, our uh, next uh, session on uh, the radiology webinar series conducted by Department of uh, Radiology, Shema. So, today's uh, topic for uh, intervention radiology discussion is role of uh, intervention radiology in obstetric and uh, gynecology. Today's uh, session will be moderated by Dr. Nirisha Shetty, who is a senior resident in the Department of Radio Diagnosis. And uh, today's uh, resource person we have with us uh, is Dr. Rajesh Venunath. And the session uh, will be chaired by Dr. Prasanna Kumar Shetty. He is a professor of um, OBG and head of uh, IVF and Reproductive Medicine Center, Shema. Over to you, ma'am. Good afternoon, everyone. To Hello, audible, right? Good afternoon. I welcome you all for this third session of our webinar series conducted by Department of uh, Kshema Radiology on behalf of uh, International Day of Radiology, this year's theme being Interventional Radiology. We have successfully completed two sessions, the first session on basic intervention and second on hepatobiliary intervention by Dr. Harshit, interventional radiologist. Here we are in our third session on intervention in obstetrics and gynecology. Today we have Dr. Rajesh Venathan sir as our resource person. To Hello. Hello, ma'am. Hello, ma'am. Okay. You're muted, I think, uh, Nirisha. Okay. Ma'am? Hello, Nirikshan, ma'am? Hello? Yeah, you can... Uh, I'm audible now? Yeah, yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am. Yes, yes. Yeah, am I audible now? Yeah, yeah, Nirish. Yeah. You're audible. Yes, yes. To chair our to chair our today's session, we have uh, Dr. Prasanna Kumar Shetty, sir, who is uh, who is a professor in obstetric and gynecology and head of Shema IVF Fertility and Reproductive Medicine Center in KSEC Day. Sir has finished his MBBS from Karnataka Medical College, Hubli from 1992 and finished his... Completed his MD OBG from a prestigious Bangalore Medical College. So has finished his advanced IVF training for clinicians from at Back Healthcare Bangalore in collaboration with the Merck and Serona and finished his observatorship in perinatal medicine from Brooklyn, New York. So is presently president of Mangalore and of uh, Mangalore Obstetric and Gynecology Society. I welcome you, sir, to chairing today's session. Over to you, Ashwin. Uh, welcome, sir. So uh, today, we have uh, Dr. Rajesh uh, Venunath, sir, who will be the resource person for today's uh, webinar. Sir has uh, done his MBBS from Government Medical College, Ernakulam, and he was a uh, final year third rank holder. And he has uh, completed his MD in radio diagnosis from uh, JJM Medical College, Davangere, 
and also he obtained his uh, dnb in radio diagnosis uh, from uh, stanley medical college and uh, he had worked in various um, colleges in kerala and karnataka as assistant professor and then he went to pursue his uh, fellowship in uh, vascular uh, interventional and onco radiology from uh, manipal uh, hospital bangalore under manipal university sir has uh, presented and attended various uh, conferences cmes uh, international as well as uh, national conferences and uh, cmes he he is uh, he is currently working as a consultant in uh, diagnostic radiology and interventional radiology at uh, jabir al ahmed hospital uh, ministry of health state of uh, kuwait welcome sir uh, for this webinar over to you sir you can we'll uh, start the academic session without any delay okay i'll be sharing my screen you can share your screen sir yeah yes sir are you able to see now yes sir all good sir okay thank you uh, first of all a warm good evening good, good afternoon for everyone uh, from kuwait and i'm really sorry because we are having a very bad weather here it's very cold and there are some difficulties with the internet but i will try my best to make this session as uh, informative as possible and i would like to thank uh, the uh, regurat sir the professor and the head of the department for giving me this opportunity to be here and it's always a warm and nostalgic feeling to be in shema because i had started my early days of my career from shema and it was a, the staff have given me ample support and guidance there especially vinod hegde sir latika shetty madam and sri krishna sir so i'm very much obliged thank you so much everyone so today my topic of discussion will be role of intervention radiology in obstetrics and gynecology this is a very novel topic because uh, not many uh, not much awareness has been created in this field so the main aim of this is to <clears throat> give you an idea about what intervention radiology can offer in terms of obstetrics and gynecology management whether it may be it emergency or non emergency or if you have a very difficult case what all kinds of assistance we can provide so to understand the role of intervention radiology in obstetrics and gynecology i begin my talk with a situation it's a clinical situation so here's a clinical scenario that you have to ponder this is a 16 year old girl diagnosed with myelodysplastic syndrome and she's admitted currently for bone marrow transplant so before the bone marrow transplant uh, she was given an induction dose of chemotherapy for bone marrow ablation and during the course of the induction chemotherapy she developed severe menorrhagia a hemoglobin dropped from 9 to 6 g per deciliter and the platelet count became very low to 12000 the patient is currently tachycardic and hypotensive and going in for hypovolemic shock so in this this is not a hypothetical situation this is a real life case and how do you manage how do you go about this case she's 16 years of old age she has she's definitely in coagulopathy and she's going in for hypovolemic shock so what do you do there is no scope for medical management here so is it logical or justified to do hysterectomy in a 16 year old girl for life threatening hemorrhage so this is uh, this is a clinical situation now i'll just begin my talk we'll come to this at the end of the talk what is the management for this so introduction uh, uh, intervention radiology basically deals with minimally invasive image guided procedures for diagnosis and treatment of various gynecological disorders and we have a wide spectrum of application due to latest advances in imaging hardware and software and better acceptance of treatment options for women who wish to retain their fertility and reproductive functions and the procedures are customizable for women who are unfit for surgery or who have major contraindications for pelvic surgery and they can have a better lifestyle after these kind of minimally invasive procedures and some of the procedures that we do are and they customized i mean they're suited for emergency situations 
So what are the benefits of the procedures that we do? We, most of our procedures are very minimally invasive. It is very, uh, it, it, it has a very low level of procedural complications. It is scarless and bloodless. We usually, all our instruments go through a two to three millimeter scar. Uh, incision, which is which heals virtually without a scar. It has very low level of mortality and morbidity. And the patients usually have a minimal hospital stay with reduced intra and post procedural pain and patient discomfort and fast relief of symptoms. And most of the procedures are done under general local anesthesia. So there is no major anesthesia related complications for any of our procedures. However, having said all this, there are certain drawbacks, especially being in a developing nation, uh, the intervention radiology setup has to be highly specialized and a good infrastructure is needed in the hospital. And the procedures are not uh, cheap, they are relatively expensive because all the hardware has to be imported, imported from abroad. And it requires a skilled and highly trained specialist in intervention radiology to do the procedure. And the procedures may not be suitable for all patients, in patients who have uh, allergy to itinated contrast reactions, you have to take certain precautions while doing the procedure. And also most of the procedures, they have a risk associated with radiation. So the beginning of the talk, I told you, it, it's, a, it's a role of intervention radiology in obstetrics and gynecology. So what is my role here? Because the patients who are pregnant, they should be protected from radiation, they are women, and there are a lot of issues, but still, there is still scope for us to do a lot of procedures which are life-saving for life-saving in these women. So I'll be discussing the role of intervention radiology under these following applications. So the most common application of intervention radiology in obstetrics and gynecology is in diagnosis of various types of gynecological malignancies. Uh, you, you have a lot of different kinds of biopsies that are done, which is transabdominal and transvaginal approach. And you have, uh, we offer post-operative assistance in drainaging and aspiration of tubular ovarian abscess or collections, be it de novo due to infection or after surgery. We offer life-saving treatment for postpartum hemorrhage. We can do treatment for procedures like uh, procedures in benign pelvic lesions like leomyoma and adenomyosis in treatment of pelvic congestion syndrome. And we have a lot of applications in infertility and assisted reproduction also. So I will not be dealing with the first one that is diagnosis of various gynecological malignancies I might, as my previous speaker has dealt with this in great length. And today we'll be dealing with like vascular cases, vascular procedures that can be done in obstetrics and gynecology. And I will also not be covering um, fetal procedures because I, I, I don't do that. So here's the role of intervention radiology. We have a role in diagnosis and treatment of gynecological oncology. We have treat, in, treat, in, deal, in patients with fibroid, we offer assistance, infertility, and in management of obstetrical hemorrhage. Now, obstetrical hemorrhage is the single most common cause of maternal mortality and morbidity worldwide. And it complicates around 5% of all deliveries of all the causes of maternal death, obstetrical hemorrhage tops. So what is postpartum hemorrhage? I think this we have been learning since UG days. It is postpartum hemorrhage is defined as blood loss of more than 500 ml after a vaginal delivery of blood, uh, blood loss of more than 1000 ml after cesarean section. So based on the timing of bleeding, postpartum hemorrhage is classified as early postpartum or primary postpartum hemorrhage, which occurs within 24 hours following delivery and the secondary postpartum hemorrhage, which occurs later than 24 hours and can exist and can extend till six weeks postpartum. So the primary postpartum hemorrhage is either due to cervical vaginal trauma or due to atonicity of the uterus, whereas secondary postpartum hemorrhage is most commonly due to retained products of placenta or due to infection. So these are the causes for uh, or the etiology for postpartum hemorrhage, which we can uh, summarize as the five T's, four T's. First is the tone. Uh, most common cause, 70% of the cases of postpartum hemorrhage is due to atonicity of the uterus. Second is trauma. Trauma can be due to pro protracted labor, a very big baby, instrumental deliveries, which can cause trauma to the uterus or cervical vaginal area. And the th fourth cause is tissue. They can be due to retained products or clots within the uterine cavity. And last but not the least is due to acquired or congenital coagulopathies, that is the thrombin. So patients with protein C or protein S deficiency, anti-throm uh, factor phi laden mutation or uh, other coagulation factor deficiencies, they are most prone to develop postpartum hemorrhage. Uh, 
Of this intervention, radiology can tackle postpartum hemorrhage due to uterine atonicity or due to trauma, but we cannot help you in this uh, retained products of placenta or con congenital coagulopathies, which has to be managed medically. So coming to risk factors for postpartum hemorrhage, any woman with previous history of postpartum hemorrhage will have a double risk in the current pregnancy. And if the patient is coagulopathy, the risk is very high. And prolonged labor, instrumental deliveries, infections like chorioamnionitis, multiple gestations, they're all prone for postpartum hemorrhage. Placental anomalies is also another rare cause of postpartum hemorrhage. It can include placental accreta, increta, as well as accentuate lobe of the placenta. So what do you do? What is the management of postpartum hemorrhage? It usually begins with resuscitation and uh, the ABCs, as you know, uh, hemodynamic resuscitation and uh, fluid as well as blood transfusion. You have to in in infuse uterotonics like oxytocin and methogen to make the uterus contract in case of atonicity. And also bimanual abdominal massage, repair of the uterine laceration and uterine packing. So these are simple methods for emergent management of postpartum hemorrhage, but still the hemorrhage is continuing what to do. So you're just left with, uh, this is a chart that highlights the medical management that includes oxytocin, mesoprostol, methogen, prostaglandin, F2-alpha, and these are the doses and the route of administration and contraindication. So if the medical management fails, the next step is surgical. You can either do a hysterectomy or you can do a surgical uterine artery ligation or uterine sutures, which are called the Beeline sutures, and this is how the sutures look like. So now we are in the 21st century and these techniques are slowly getting outdated with the development of intervention radiology as we offer minimally invasive technique for management of obstetric hemorrhage. So what we do is call, uh, you, uh, we, we can do a procedure called embolization. So here is a 32 year old female with post cesarean section. She, the cesarean section was completely uneventful but in the 24 hours period on the follow up day, what happens is that her hemoglobin dropped from nine to six gram per deciliter. And she was taken up for a CT scan, which showed a laceration or a dehiscence in the lower uterine segment with the collection in the left para uterine area. And there was active extravasation of contrast also, which is seen in the CT scan. So she had a scar dehiscence period. So she was not, uh, she was unstable and she, she was not fit for an emergent surgery. So we took her up for an embolization. You can see the vessels here. These are abnormal dilated vessels. And we embolized with PVR particles and you see that the bleeding has stopped. So that was about postpartum hemorrhage. Now we deal with the next uh, common disease that we can tackle through intervention radiology, which is leomyomas. Leomyomas are nothing but they are benign growth of smooth muscle tissues. They're commonly seen in the uterus and they're the most common benign tumors of the uterus. The other common sites for leomyomas are stomach, cervix, urinary bladder, and esophagus. And they're more common in 20 to 30% of women in the reproductive age group between 25 and 45. And the interesting fact is that these are hormone sensitive tumors. They respond, uh, they increase in size with estrogen and progesterone. And due to this hormone sensitivity, they are very rare in prepubertal girls, and most of the tumors are involute after menopause. And they increase in size during pregnancy and also in women taking oral contraceptives. So the clinical presentation, most of the women, that is 30% of the women who have fibroids are completely asymptomatic, irrespective of the size of the fibroids. Major portion, that is 50% of the patients, they present with abnormal, uh, abnormal, abnormal vaginal bleeding. Many of them can have mass effects that causes lower abdominal pain, bubble and bladder symptoms. And depending upon the location of the fibroid, if it's a cervical fibroid or a coronal fibroid, they can present with infertility, recurrent abortions, malpresentations. And uh, if the, depending upon the, if it's a large size fibroid, they can have a, uh, they can present with palpable mass per abdomen. So these are the risk factors for developing uterine fibroids. Uh, you have both environmental as well as genetic factors. Age of the patient, they're more common between 25 and 35 years of age. They're hormone-sensitive tumors. They respond well to estrogen and progesterone. Race and genetics are also important factor. They're more common in African and Asian women and very rare in whites. And lifestyle is also another important factor. Uh, diet and lifestyle, it is more common in women taking a lot of uh, non-veg and fatty food. And it is more common in obese women also for some reason with high BMI. Now, a general overview of the pathophysiology of the development of fibroids. 
The myometrium is found to have some stem cells which are very totipotent. So what happens is that under, uh, due to genetic or environmental factors, they can have mutation and call for A5 or call for A6 gene. And the, the myometry stem cells, they usually transform into a cell called fibroid progenitor cells. This can be under the influence of hormones like estrogen, progesterone, or beta catenin. So the myometry stem cell, they transform into fibroid progenitor cells. The fibroid progenitor cells are slow growing cells, and then you can later differentiate to form a, a mass of tissue within the myometry, which is called a preclinical fibroid. The preclinical fibroid can remain dormant over a period of time. Uh, but under the certain environmental factors like vitamin D deficiency, high fatty diet or hormones or environmental toxin, they get stimulated to, to proliferate. And also there are biological mediators that help these uh, preclinical fibroids to go undergo proliferation, uh, the transforming growth factor beta, fibrogenic growth factor, retinoic acid, etc. And once the preclinical fibroid, they started proliferating, you can harm the clinical fibroid formation due to proliferation of the fibroblast as well as smooth vessels of the vascular endothelium. So this is an image that we have been seeing time and again from our UG days. Uh, so this is the classification of fibroids based on the location. Fibroids can be pedunculated or sessile. They can be completely pedunculated and submucosal with, and projecting into the endometrial cavity. Majority of the fibroids are intramural, that is, they are located within the myometrium, and a small proportion of them will be subserous, that is, they are located under the serosa. And this is this is the FIGO classification, which is a subclassification of fibroids based on the location. They are, they are classified from zero to seven types. Zero is completely pedunculated and within located entirely within the endometrial cavity. And type seven is a pedunculated subserosal fibroids and two to five are all intramural fibroids, less uh, depending upon the coverage of myometrium. So this is a FIGO classification. Now, extra uterine leomyomas, they can be with broad ligament leomyoma, cervical leomyoma, parasitic leomyomas. Parasitic leomyomas are leomyomas that are present within the peritoneal cavity and they migrate or they move about the abdomen. And they can be diffuse leomyomatosis of the abdomen also, which is a benign metastasizing condition where the abdomen cavity is filled with fibroids of varying sizes. As I told you, pathology, they are monoclonal bundles of smooth muscle cells and uh, with variable amount of connective tissue. These tumors are poorly encapsulated and have a characteristic world pattern. The etiology of these tumors are not well known, but they have a high genetic predisposition and tend to run in the families. And they are most common in women of the reproductive age group. And most of the women, they have multiple fibroids with variable sizes. And they can undergo amorphous calcification, which can be detected in x-rays. And these calcifications are called womb stones. So this is a cut section of the uterus showing multiple fibroids. They have a characteristic gray-white cut section with the world pattern of the uh, world appearance. This appearance is also seen in MRI. So there are the fascicles of smooth muscle cells, which proliferate into worlds separated by connective tissue. These fibroids are notorious for undergoing degeneration. You have the hyaline degeneration, cystic degeneration, myxoid degeneration, and red degeneration. Hyaline degeneration is the most common type of degeneration. The degenerations are important because the signal intensity in MRI depends upon the degeneration of the fibroid. So hyaline degeneration is the most common and occurs in 60% of the cases. Cystic degeneration occurs in 5%, and myxoid degeneration is uncommon, and uh, it's, it's highly uncommon. Red degeneration is characteristically seen in pregnancy where the fibroid enlarges in size and it becomes a very painful condition. Now coming to radiological diagnosis, how do you diagnose a fibroid? Fibroids are most commonly diagnosed with ultrasound because it's cheap, non-invasive with no ionizing radiation. And leomyomas, they usually present as hypoechoic masses within the myometrium. And calcification is seen as echogenic foci with shadowing. And if the fibroid is showing cystic areas or necrosis, you should suspect degeneration. And fibroids, they usually show some amount of vascularity in the periphery, but the internal central portion does not show much of vascularity. This is a plain radiograph showing uh, ill-defined uh, lesion in the pelvis with uh, calcification. There are two types of calcification for the fibroids. You have the stipulated calcification and you have the amorphous coarse calcification. Both these are called, the, the, this leads to the appearance of the womb stones. Now, CT is not a sensitive modality for detecting fibroids. This fibroids are suspected only when there is an abnormality in the contour of the uterus. And the enhancement pattern of the fibroids is variable on CT. The calcification can, be, however, be detected well. 
So these are the CT appearances of the fibroid. rod. You can see that the uterus is enlarged with multiple calcification and heterogeneous enhancement. And here you can see an intrauterine contraceptive device, which is displaced due to the enlarging fibroids. So CT is not a very good modality as you cannot tell how many fibroids are there, what is the location of the fibroid or whether it's degenerating or not. So MRI is the most sensitive modality for detecting fibroids and MRI is the investigation that has to be done before the patient is taken up for any procedure for documentation of the number of fibroids, the site of fibroid, as well as any uh, suspicious areas of sarcomatous transformation. So most of the fibroids, they are ISO to hypointense on T1-weighted images and hyper -intense, high, again hypointense on T2-weighted images. So in both T1 and T2, normal fibroid without any degeneration are hypointense. However, if the fibroid is showing cystic degeneration, it can be hypointense on T1-weighted images and hyperintense on T2-weighted images. And if the fibroid is showing hemorrhage, they will be hyperintense on T1 due to the deposition of blood products. And any degenerating fibroids like hyaline degeneration, they can also show high intensity on T1-weighted images. And gadolinium contrast enhancement, they show variable enhancement. Most of the fibroids, they only show a peripheral rim pattern of enhancement, but some, of, some can also show heterogeneous internal enhancement also. So this is a sagittal T2-weighted image of the pelvis, which shows an enlarged uterus with multiple fibroids. These are the myometrium as a hyperintense signal, and the fibroids are usually ill-defined or poorly encapsulated with the heterogeneous hypoechoic center. And um, this characteristic world pattern is typical of leomyomas. And they usually distort the contour of the uterus as well as the endometrial cavity. So this is another 45 year old woman who presented with an abdominal mass of long standing duration. You can see that the, uh, this is a T1 weighted image in which the mass is ISO to hypo intense, ISO intense basically to the myometrium. And this is a T2 weighted image. You can see that it is hypo intense with the world pattern. And this is a contrast enhancement. This fibroid was showing heterogeneous in enhancement after gadolinium contrast. Now coming to complications of fibroid, they can invade into the vascular channels leading to a formation uh, condition called intravenous eomyomas, and they can undergo malignant transformation. Malignant transformation of fibroids are pretty rare. They occur, occur for, they account for only 0.1 to 0.5%. So malignant transformation is suspected when the high, uh, fibroid shows heterogeneous enhancement or cystic areas. And benign metastasizing leomyomas are extremely rare in which the leomyoma can parasitize and migrate anywhere into the abdomen. Uh, Submucosal leomyomas, they can undergo torsion, which is a very, it's, it's an emergency condition. Aseptic degeneration of the my myoma can lead to formation of pyomyoma. So coming to treatment option for fibroids, there, are, there is a medical treatment option, surgical treatment option, as well as a non-surgical alternatives for management of fibroid. Medical options include uh, oral contraceptive pills, <clears throat> progesterone-only pills, NSAIDs, tranexamic acid, GNRH analogs, etc. And surgical options include hysterectomy and myomectomy. Myomectomy can be laparoscopic as well or hysteroscopic, depending upon the type of fibroid. And the non-surgical alternatives that we, we are going to talk about in this session is uterine artery embolization, as well as fibroid embolization with ultrasound, which is called high-intensity focused ultrasound, which is an MR-guided procedure. So why not have a hysterectomy? It is very common for the women, if there are any menstrual symptom and they're approaching menopause to undergo a hysterectomy. But in this part of the world, hysterectomy is not advised because many of the women, they tend to have a psychological complications after using the uterus or they don't want to uh, lose their womanhood or there are a lot of uh, issues with that. So why not have a hysterectomy? The main reason is uh, hysterectomy is a very complicated surgery and they can have surgical adverse effects. And later they can have pelvic support issues because uh, once the uterus is removed, the pelvic support is gone. They can have bladder dysfunction, uh, early menopause and complications of menopause like hot flushes, a lack of libido. And um, since it's a surgical procedure, they have to have a hospitalization with recovery time. And hysterectomy is also an expensive procedure. They have loss of sexual dysfunction after the surgery and the uh, and this fear of losing femininity and fertility. So what we offer is uterine artery embolization, which is a quick and effective way of controlling fibroids. Not only has it, ha it has application and management of fibroids, but it can be used for management of adenomyosis, uterine arteriovenous malformation, was first reported effectively 
recently studied by Ravina et al, who is a doctor. Ravina et al studied extensively the uterine artery embolization and, and No, it's fine, sir. No, it's fine. Okay. <clears throat> so, Dr. Ravina Atal in 1995, he was the first Parisian doctor to describe this uterine artery embolization in great depths in literature. <clears throat> the first uterine artery embolization in history was done in 1974 by the Parisian doctor Jean Jacques Merlin, who is a neuroradiologist, and he successfully performed the first uterine artery embolization for a patient with intractable menorrhagia. She was a very dis severely disabled woman who could not undergo any surgery, and they embolized the uterus with uh, I think some blood clots, uh, autologous blood clots and stopped her bleeding. And therapeutic success rates for uterine artery embolization is around 88. Uh, in our country, it is around 90%. And it has a reduced operative mortality and morbidity. The advantage of this procedure is that fertility and menstrual functions are well preserved. So coming to the advantages, as I told you, it is, uh, it's a procedure which is suitable for women who are deemed unfit for surgery. The fertility and menstrual functions are preserved. There are no anesthesia-related complications as such. It is completely scarless and bloodless, and it is highly effective in controlling symptoms of fibroid. Now coming to indications of what type of women can undergo this procedure, uh, any, any women with fibroids having dysfunctional uterine bleeding, it can be extended to adenomyosis. Those women with adenomyosis and fibroids, they can be taken up for embolization. Uterine artery pseudoaneurysms, which can be congenital or acquired after multiple DNCs. Uterine arteriovenous malformations and post-trauma. Any kind of trauma to the uterus, which is bleeding and the patient cannot have a hysterectomy, you can take up for, uh, you can refer for embolization. Now, there are certain contraindications for the procedure, which are mostly relative. Uh, any contraindication to angiography that, that's again a related, contra, it's very relative. Severe anaphylactic reaction to contrast media. In such cases, the patient has to be premedicated according to the hospital protocol. Uncorrected coagulopathy is again a relative contraindication, renal insufficiency, and pregnancy is an absolute contraindication. If the patient is pregnant, she cannot undergo uterine artery embolization. Active pelvic inflammation, prior pelvic radiation, and technical difficulties to the procedure can occur if the patient had a prior radiation or the prior surgery in which the uterine artery anatomy is altered. In such cases, it is very difficult to cannulate the uterine artery and the technical failure is high. So that is why prior surgery with adhesion is a relative contraindication. So how do you evaluate the patient for this procedure? Uh, it is usually referred to us from the gynecology clinics. The patient has to be thoroughly evaluated with history and clinical examination by the gynecologist. And the patient should have a pelvic ultrasound and a contrast enhanced MRI to determine the type of fibroid, the site of fibroid, the number and the location. And a urine pregnancy test is mandatory to rule out pregnancy before the procedure. And the patient should have a complete blood workup, including CBC, PTINR, serology, LFT, RFT, and electrolytes. And the pap smear and endometrial biopsy is mandatory in this country to rule out associ in associated cervical or endometrial carcinoma, because if the patient has cervical endometrial carcinoma, she's not an ideal candidate for embolization. She, it's a waste. Uh, so relative history of other medical problems and allergies should also be evaluated. Now, how to select candidates for UAE? Uh, women with multiple fibroids, multiple fibroids in the sense multiple intramural fibroids are ideal candidates for embolization. And the size criteria is also important because the women, uh, not all fibroids are amendable for embolization, only those with size less than 14 weeks. That is, it should be less than the level of the umbilicus or it, it, the uterus should be within the pelvis. And those uh, fibroids, they are ideally treated with embolization. The larger the size, uh, you, you, if you have a very large fibroid, the, like we, there is a limitation on us to use the number of particles or the embolization becomes incomplete. In that case, if the fibroid is hypoxic, it usually tends to get a parasitic blood supply from another area and then tends to grow. So ideally, the fibroid should be less than 14 weeks in size. And pedunculated fibroids, be it subserous or submucous, pedunculated fibroids are a contraindication or it, it doesn't suit, the embolization doesn't suit these people because if it's a subserous fibroid, what happened? It can get detached and the fibroid expulsion is like a very painful condition. It's like an abortion or labor in which the fibroid will be expelled within one week of procedure. And uh, the subserous fibroid, what happens is that it can get detached and it, it migrates into the peritoneal cavity. So that's why I told you ideal candidates are those with less than 14 weeks and it should be intramural fibroid. 
and even cervical fibroids and broad ligament fibroids are not ideal candidates for embolization. And this is an ideal procedure for women, very young women and unmarried women because the fertility and reproductive functions are well preserved. So coming to pre-procedural uh, evaluation, uh, the patient should be counseled regarding the post-procedural pain because embolization causes ischemia to the fibroid, which is very painful. And the pain is very similar to what the women experience during labor or during periods, but only thing it will be protracted for, for a period of at least three to four days following the procedure. So most of the women, they tolerate NSAIDs after the procedure, but if the pain is very similar, you have to go for a patient controlled analgesia with fentanyl, or if it is very similar, severe, the interventional radiologist may choose to perform a hypogastric nerve block. And the patient is, it, it's usually uh, uh, like a day procedure in which the patient gets admitted the previous evening. The procedure will be the following morning and the next day morning, the patient gets discharged. And <clears throat> six to eight hours of fasting is necessary before the procedure. And the bladder must be catheterized before the procedure because what happens is that you're using contrast. The contrast can get filled in the bladder and obscure the uterus. So the bladder must be catheterized. And the uh, IV fluid and algesia, antiemetic antibiotics, all the routine pre-surgical protocols must be followed. Now coming to the blood supply of the uterus, the blood supply of the uterus is usually from the internal iliac artery, from the anterior division of the internal iliac artery, the first branch that arises is the uterine artery commonly, and it has a medial course towards the midline, which is horizontal, and then later ascends up along the lateral margin of the uterus to an astomose with the branches of the ovarian artery near the cornua of the fallopian tube. And um, there are some inferior branches that supply the cervical uh, vaginal area also. So uterus has two uh, uterine arteries and if there are fibroids, both the uterine arteries must be selectively candidated and embolized. So uh, they have, scientists have studied the different variations in the uh, anatomy or the way in which the uterine artery can arise from the anterior division of internal iliac artery. Uh, usually the internal iliac artery has an anterior trunk and the posterior trunk and the first division is the uterine artery and the second division is the superior vesicle artery and the superior vesicle artery and the uterine artery is usually they are separate they have a wide distance of separation sometimes the origin is two uh, and these are different models that have been proposed based on the origin sometimes the uterine artery will be the second artery which is arising or sometimes the uterine artery can even be a separate branch separate from the anterior as well as the posterior trunk so this is only for theoretical purpose. This is not uh, practically important. So how do you perform a uterine artery embolization? Uh, the most common access for the procedure is you from the common femoral artery and you gain the access with the help of ultrasound. And uh, once the access is secured, uh, you have to cannulate the internal iliac artery. And from the anterior division, you have to go selectively into the uterine artery. So the main cannulation can be done with the help of SIM catheter, Cobra catheter, or you can use uh, Robert's uterine artery catheter also. And from there, you can go selectively into the branches of the fibroid using the microcatheter. And what are the common materials that you use for embolization? You can use a temporary embolization agent like gel form, or you can use a permanent embolization agent most commonly used as PVA particles. So this is how the uterine artery embolization principle is. You take a microcatheter and you go distally into the branches that supply the fibroid. And once you, you feel that you are in a very suitable position, you can inject PVA particles. PVA particles are nothing but polyvinyl alcohol particles. They're injected along with saline and contrast, and they go and plug the microcirculation of the fibroids. And the fibroid will undergo ischemic necrosis. So this is a patient who underwent the bilateral uterine artery embolization. You can see this is the left side and this is the right side. This is the internal iliac artery and the anterior division. And you can see that the uterine artery arising here and with the characteristic corkscrew appearance pattern, corkscrew pattern of the uterine artery. And the uterine artery, they cross the midline and anastomose with the opposite side. Along the curvature of the uterus, it is called the arcuate arteries. And once they penetrate the myometrium, they're called the spiral arteries. So uh, it is, like if it is for a diffuse uh, diffuse involvement of the uterus, you need not go selectively distally. You can embolize proximally also. Uh, whereas if it is only a solitary fibroid or you can, it's just a focal pathology, it is advised to go as distal as possible. So this is the um, pre-embolization uh, image and this is the post-embolization image in which after the PVA particles are infused, the fibroids are all disappeared. It's, it's not taking up any contrast. <clears throat> 
And this staining is the characteristic staining that is seen after embolization. That is the blood and the PVA particles, they block the microcirculation and they show this characteristic staining. So this is the same procedure which is repeated on the right side. And these are the materials that are required for embolization. You, you need a vascular sheet, which is a 500 vascular sheet. You need a hydrophilic wire. You need a suitable catheter. You can use either gel form or PVA particles. So the catheter that we most commonly use for uterine artery embolization can be a Cobra catheter C2, it can be a Sims catheter, or it can be a Roberts uterine catheter also. And the PVA particles, they are polyvinyl alcohol particles, and they are available in various sizes. Depending upon the uh, vascular pattern that you see in angiographic images, there can be 100 to 300 microns, 300 to 500 microns, or 500 to 700 microns. So the more smaller the particles, the more distal can be the embolization because smaller particles tend to migrate distally and they block the distal vessels. Whereas if you see a lot of tortuous vessels and you, you, it's, you, it's better to use a higher size particle. So most commonly we use 300 to 500 or 500 to 700 micron particles. So if it's a temporary embolization, and this is how the PVA particles look like in the syringe, they're dispersed evenly, they're white beads, and they're injected directly into the catheter. Uh, and this is how you prepare a gel form. Gel form is a temporary embolizing agent. Gel form stands for gelatin, and they are available in the form of sheets. And you cut the sheets and make them into pellets. And you have to make a slurry with these pellets. That you have to take this uh, pellets in a syringe and attach it to a three-way and another syringe with saline and contrast. And then you mix to form a slurry like this. And the slurry is injected. And this is a historic Roberts uterine artery catheter. It is a reverse shaped catheter with primary curve and the secondary curve, and it's a 90 degree curve and uh, not 90, 180 degree curve. And this can be used to cannulate the internal aortic artery with very ease. So how well does uterine artery embolization work? So after the procedure, the bleeding related symptoms usually resolve in 85% of the women. The mass-related symptoms often resolve in 70% of the women. And for the mass-related symptom to resolve, it should it will take a minimum of three to six months. And the procedure is effective for multiple fibroids. And uh, the chances of a repeat procedure are very less. It's usually less than 5%. Now, coming to advantages and disadvantages of the procedure, the advantages is that the, all the fibroids are treated in one session. It is very minimally invasive. There are no risk of complications. The recurrence is often very rare. It has a very short recovery time compared to surgery. There is absolutely no adhesions or scar formation. There is very minimal blood loss and there's no need for any blood transfusion. And it is usually done under conscious sedation. And very rarely, if the woman is very apprehensive that they need to go for general anesthesia. And the emotional, physical, sexual well-being of the women is well taken care of after UAE. The disadvantage, however, is that no matter how selective you are and how good you are, 10 to 15% of the fibroids, they inherently do not respond to embolization. Uh, that is because they have uh, multiple sources of blood supply or they're inherently not very, very sensitive to ischemia. So 10 to 15%, they do not respond uh, or they're called as non-responders. And technical failure or technical failure in doing the procedure is only seen in 2% of the patients. And of these 2%, only 1% they require hysterectomy. Uh, most of them can be managed either by supportive medical measures or a repeat procedure. And the most common uh, disadvantage or the very uh, troublesome thing after the procedure is the cramping pelvic pain. As I told you, uh, if the woman has multiple fibroids or the fibroids are too large in number, the cramping pain can um, be very unbearable and it can last for even one to two weeks. So the patient should usually be counseled. It's not a, it's just a worrisome symptom and it's, it is not, uh, it, it does not, it's not, it's not an emergency or it's, it's just something to be worried about, nothing else. There's no complication because of the pain. So there was a study uh, that was done to assess the efficacy of uterine artery embolization. It was found that menorrhagia improves in 90% of the women. And for the menorrhagia to improve, it takes a minimum of two cycles. That is the first cycle immediately following the procedure is usually very heavy. And it will take the next subsequent cycle, the blood loss, the amount as well as the duration of blood loss comes down. And bulk related symptoms usually improve in 80% of the women and it takes around three to six months for the bulk related symptoms. And this is the target that has to be achieved. That is 50% of the fibroids, should, the fibroids should reduce 50% of the volume in one year. And technical success of UA, I told you it is around 89 to 98%. And clinical failure can occur due to collaterals from the ovarian artery. And clinical failure is less than uh, 10. That is usually around 
So follow up care, what, uh, what do you advise the women after the procedure is that they should visit the clinic two to three weeks after the procedure to assess the, um, to, for a clinical assessment. And then she should have an MRI done at three months, six months at one year. And this has to be a contrast MRI. It, uh, if the patient is very reluctant for follow up, an MRI has to be done in six months and one year to measure the size of the fibroid as well as the fibroid volume. So these are the complications that can occur after the procedure. The, the, the most important one is a post-procedural pain. They can be managed with patient control analgesia or a hypogastric nerve block. As in any pr procedure, there's a small risk of bleeding infection, contrast allergy, fibroid expulsion, I've already told you. There is a small chance of ovarian failure due to inherent uh, injection of the particles into the ovarian circulation. I told you the uterine artery anastomos with the ovarian artery. So the particles, they're being, if they are using a very small particle, sometimes they can go into the ovary and cause ovarian failure and the patient can have symptoms of menopause. post embolization syndrome is an unusual syndrome. Uh, it's, it's a flu-like symptom that develops after embolization. The patient can have fever, elevated ESR, leukocytosis, and they can be managed with aspirin or other supportive measures. Non-target embolization is a term in which uh, you, the PVA particles are uh, injected into areas that are not desirable. So the most common uh, side effect is a blue leg syndrome in which the instead of injecting into the internal iliac, if the particles go into the external iliac artery, they can cause occlusion of the lower limb vein, lower limb vessels, and the patient can present with cyanosis and digital uh, ischemic symptoms. The, 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 that is called a blue leg symptom, uh, blue leg syndrome. So access site complications are very rare because now we are, nowadays we are doing ultrasound guided puncture. There can be pseudoaneurysm formation, dissection of the vessel, thrombosis, and arteriovenous fistula formation. All these are very rare complications. And anesthesia related complications if the patient chooses to opt for general anesthesia. Now there are certain studies that compares UAE with hysterectomy and UAE with other modalities like myomectomy. So in this slide, I have outlined the results of UAE versus hysterectomy. The outcome after UAE in terms of symptom control are identical to hysterectomy at both one year and five year follow up. Uh, the UAE has a shorter hospital stay and recovery rate. The complication rates are however, very similar to both modalities of treatment. The pre-discharge complications are more common after surgery and the post-discharge complications are more common after UAE. Re-intervention rates were higher in this study uh, for UAE, which was almost 32%, but in our uh, clinical practice, it is less than 10%. And cost-effective analysis shows that UAE to be significantly cheaper. Coming to UAE versus myomectomy, there were only two uh, randomized controlled trials comparing myomectomy with other treatment options. In both the studies, they found that symptom control and mass-related uh, symptom control complications rates were both similar for both UAE as well as the myomectomy groups. And the recovery time and hospital stay was significantly shorter for UAE than myomectomy. However, re-intervention rates were higher for UAE. Now coming to the topic fertility after UAE, uh, there is the FEMI trials. There's a very famous FEMI trial that uh, assess the fertility after UAE. And they found out that patients after UAE with fibroids, they have reduced rates of miscarriages, that the miscarriages dropped from 32% to 17% in two years in women with uh, fibroids after UAE. However, there is an increased rate of cesarean section and postpartum hemorrhage after UAE. And there is less rate of malpresentation and small for date fetus after uterine artery embolization. Now I'll show you a case here of a 42 year old female who was diagnosed to have multiple uterine fibroids, but she refused surgery because she wanted to preserve her fertility. And here you can see the right uterine artery, which is tortuous and dilated with multiple, multiple cork screw pattern and it was successfully embolized with PVA particles. Now coming to UAE and adenomyosis. Adenomyosis is nothing but the presence of ectopic endometrial glands within the myometrium. There are two types of adenomyosis, which can be focal or diffuse, and they're most commonly seen in perimenopausal age group. So just because they are in the perimenopausal age groups and the symptoms can be very irritating that the patient opts for hysterectomy, but... Uh, uh, we can do uh, this. Uh, previously, what was the finding, re research finding was that UAE was not very effective for adenomyosis, but now we have improved the technique as well as the embolization material which is used. And now it is showing promising good results in these patients also. And uh, adenomyosis, the patients usually present with menorrhagia, dysmenorrhea, and dyspareunia. The diagnosis can often be made with ultrasound and MRI. An ultrasound will show an enlarged uterus with thickened junctional zone and heterogeneous myometrium with multiple small cysts within the myometrium. So what UAE causes is that it causes cessation to the flow of the adenomatous tissue, which subsequently become infect <clears throat> ischemic and shrinks in size. 
And most of the women, they get symptomatic relief and show clinical improvement. And it alleviates the need for hysterectomy in 60% of the cases. So here is a 41-year-old lady with diffuse adenomyomatous of the uterus. You can see the uterus is enlarged with multiple abnormal uh, dilated vessels. And she was successfully treated with uh, uh, embolization in the uterus. Uh, you can see that the pre-procedure and post-procedure uterus has shrunken in size. Now, the next indication for fibroid embolization is uter uterine arteriovenous malformations. These are very rare. However, if it's a tertiary center, these patients usually get referred to you. And uh, uterine arteriovenous mal malformations are defined as uh, fistulous communication between the artery and the vein without an intervening capillary network. They can be either congenital or acquired. The most common ones are acquired due to prior uh, previous multiple DNC procedures, then they can present with pelvic pain and life-threatening uterine bleeding. Now, the diagnosis is often made with ultrasound, contrast CT, or MRI. And ultrasound will show that the malformations are usually, usually are subtle areas of inhomogeneities within the myometrium. You can see the serpentinous vascular uh, channels within the myometrium. And when you put color, you can see that they show a lot of color uptake. And on power Doppler, these vessels show high velocity, low resistance flow and the resistance index of these vessels usually will be less than 0.5. So this is an MR, MR findings of uh, um, uh, uterine artery venous malformation. They're usually located within the myometrium, but they can extend into the parametrium also. And uh, they, uh, the being vascular flow channels, they, are, they present as flow voids on spin echo sequences. That is on T1 and T2 weighted images, they can present as serpentinous flow voids. And you can see the uh, you can see on contrast enhanced dynamic MR angiography will show the multiple feeding vessels as well as the draining vein. The feeding vessels are usually from the division of the internal iliac artery and very rarely from the external iliac artery. And the draining veins is either into the pelvic vein or into the gonadal vein. So this is a patient with a uh, acquired uh, AV malformation in the anterior aspect of the uterus. You can see the bladder here, the anterior wall of the uterus. There is a flow void which is showing intense. Contra, uh, intense color uh, flow and the high velocity, low resistance flow on Doppler. And uh, this is another patient who CT is showing an arteriovenous malformation. You can see that the feeding vessels are from the right-sided uh, internal iliac arteries and the draining vein into the left-sided gonadal vein. So this is a case of a 41-year-old male with acquired uh, a, a arteriovenous malformation of the uterus, which was treated with onyx. So onyx is a liquid embolic agent that we use for treatment of AV malformations. And uh, the onyx can be injected in a controlled manner, and it has a very slow settling rate. So you can inject a large volume into the nidus, and it stays in the nidus, and then solidifies at a later date. So this is the onyx cast. Onyx is nothing but... Uh, uh, it is ethylene vinyl alcohol in, uh, in DMSO, which is uh, opacified with tantalum. So it is ethylene vinyl alcohol in DMSO opacified with tantalum. And uh, the name onyx is because it represents, it, the color is very similar to that of the onyx gemstone. And it is very useful for uh, management of AV malformations, especially in the brain also. And for neuro interventions, we tend to use this a lot. So the next application for interventional radiology is in cases of morbidly adherent placenta. Uh, these are not very uh, uncommon because I myself have seen or two, three cases of morbidly adherent placenta that we had to intervene. So morbidly adherent placenta is usually of three types. You have placenta accreta, percreta, and increta, and they can have serious pregnancy complications requiring uh, that lead to life-threatening maternal hemorrhage requiring large volume blood transfusion and a high rate of perinatal hysterectomy with fetal as well as maternal mortality and morbidity. And the incidence is around one in 2,500 deliveries. And these cases usually refer to you during the weekends or when it is a, when it's a New Year's Eve or something, these, they, they just tend to show up. So moderately adrenal placenta, 75% of them are accreta, 18% increta, and very rare is percreta. So what is this accreta, percreta, and increta? This is a normal uh, placenta, which has the fetal component, which is chorionic frontosum, and the maternal component, which is the decidua basalis. And the decidua basalis has an interbooks membrane, which uh, prevents invasion of the trophoblastic villi into the myometrium. So in patients who are multiparous or they have had a previous cesarean section, the zygote, when it gets implanted, it fails to form the nitabooks membrane. In that case, what happens is that uh, the placental villus can infiltrate the myometrium and the placenta gets adherent to the myometrium, which is called placenta accreta. Uh, 
when it starts invading into the myometrium, causing more than 50% of the myometrial thickness is invaded, it is called increta. And when the, uh, the villus, they come uh, externally into the cirrhosis surface, they are called percreta. And percreta is a dangerous type of placenta because the surgeon find it difficult to remove this and they can show infiltration into the bladder or the rectum. So what do you do if you have a patient who is pregnant and she has a morbidly adherent placenta? Uh, the first step is to diagnose this in the prenatal period. And uh, these are the risk factors that help you to give a clue that this condition do exist. Uh, if the women had a previous cesarean session, if she's of advanced maternal age, and they're usually seen in low-lying placenta and multiparous women. So I, I told you the pathophysiology is because when she had a previous cesarean section or lower segment cesarean section, the subsequent pregnancies, they tend to have a low implantation of the zygote and the placentas are usually anterior with lack of metabox membrane, which lead to uncontrolled placental invasion into the myometrium. And what we offer is a, a prophylactic balloon occlusion of internal iliac artery to prevent maternal hemorrhage in, during the time of delivery. So what happened, these women who are suspected to have a placental invasion, So how do you suspect, uh, sorry, uh, how do you suspect these patients have uh, invasive placenta is that you can do an ultrasound in which, which shows a lack of retroplacental clear space. And they can see that there is no clear delineation between the placenta and the myometrium. So the lack of retroplacental clear space gives a clue to the diagnosis of uh, adherent placenta. And uh, the investigation of choice is an MRA in which the sagittal T2 weighted images will show you that there is very thin myometrium anterior to the placenta, and you can also see direct invasion of the placenta into the bladder. So uh, it is advised that all women who are multiparous, more than three, to have an MRA examination to look for placenta if it's a low-lying placenta, uh, morbidly adherent placenta if it's a low-lying placenta I've seen in ultrasound. Now, what is prophylactic balloon occlusion is that the patients with morbidly adherent placenta, they usually deliver at 34 to 35 weeks. The most of the babies, they have to be delivered preterm. And the patients are usually referred to a hospital with multidisciplinary team. They, they should have a qualified gynecologist, an intervention radiologist, and a neonatologist with adequate blood bank facilities. And the high risk consent is taken because the uh, consent is taken for two procedures. One is the internal iliac balloon occlusion, and second is for the surgery. And the surgery has a very high risk because the patient has to have a cesarean section and then later removal of the uh, read, uh, uh, removal of the placenta. And what we do is that balloon occlusion, it is found to reduce maternal mortality and avoid postpartum hysterectomy. So what we do is that uh, during the time of delivery, I mean, before the patient is taken up for cesarean section, we puncture bilateral common femoral arteries and we place two crossover balloons into the proximal part of the anterior division of internal iliac artery. It need not be into the uterine artery. You can block the anterior division of in internal iliac artery as such because the uterus will be so big that you'll not be able to identify the vessels properly. So the proximal aspect of the internal iliac artery, you place two small balloons, which can either be 4 mm or 5 mm in size. And once the patient's balloon are positioned, the patient is taken up for cesarean section. And what the, the uh, gynecologists, uh, they do a normal cesarean section. And once the cord is clamped, the intervention radiologist will inflate these balloons and occlude the anterior division of internal iliac artery. So the blood supply to the uterus is blocked. So once the blood supply is blocked, the surgeon can go ahead and remove the placenta. And if the surgeon is unsuccessful in removing the placenta, what we do is that we'll take, the up, uh, take up this patient again in cath lab. We'll exchange the balloons for catheters. And then we'll inject PVA particles and embolize the capillary blood of the placenta. In that case, the bleeding will be stopped. So this is a multidisciplinary team approach. And usually this procedure is done in a hybrid OT. Hybrid OT is in which they have the OT setup as well as a cath lab in the same room. So this is a technique in uh, short, uh, bilateral common femoral arteries are punctured and the axis is secured with five front sheet. They can lay the anterior division of internal iliac arteries and two small five into four mm balloons are placed in the proximal aspect of the internal iliac artery. And the balloon is usually inflated with three to five ml of contrast saline after the clamping of the cord. And it is inflated till the surgeon removes the placenta. If the surgeon is not able to remove the placenta, the balloons are inflated and the patient is shifted for embolization. So this is a hybrid roti that we have. And these are the images showing the balloon catheters inside before the cesarean section. So this is a case that we have done. It's a case of a 30-year-old Gravida 3 with low-lying placenta. Uh, and uh, MRI was showing the placental invasion into the myometrium, and she was successfully managed with 
perioperative bilateral internal LA artery occlusion. So this is what we did. We punctured both the femoral arteries. We did a crossover and then we placed two balloons. You can see small balloons on both the proximal aspect of the anterior division of internal LA artery. And this were the balloons that were inflated during the time of cesarean section. The surgeons, however, in this case, were able to remove the placenta because it was not completely invading. It was just a placenta accreta. So they removed and we didn't have to do an embolization. We, uh, the, like once the cesarean is over, we removed the balloon and the patient is now doing fine. So in cases in which the surgeon is not able to remove the placenta, we go ahead and we embolize the placental bed with PBA particles. So complications of the procedure is that during the procedure, the patient can develop deep vein thrombosis because pregnancy is a hypercoagulable state. They can develop pulmonary embolism, amniotic fluid embolism, blue leg syndrome, and very rarely internal LA artery rupture. Now the next condition that we offer our services is in pelvic congestion syndrome. Pelvic congestion syndrome is usually undiagnosed and it is a cause of chronic pelvic pain. It is also known as pelvic varicose veins and is usually seen in 15% of the women between 20 and 50 years of age. And the diagnosis is often missed because it's not seen in most of the clinical scenario with ultrasound because most of the pelvic veins are situated very deep and they're not seen well in ultrasound. And these veins, they tend to enlarge in size during pregnancy, leading to symptoms of vague abdominal pain and vaginal discharge. And 30% of these patients, they usually have a pelvic congestion alone and 15% have associated fibroids also. And the good thing is that these veins, they reduce in size after menopause. So these are the symptoms with which the patient can present. They can have dull aching pain or low back pain, which is worse following intercourse during periods or during pregnancy. And the pain is worse on standing up and it reduces on lying down. Other symptoms with which the patient can present is irritable bladder, abnormal menstrual bleeding, vaginal discharge, and varicose veins within the vulva and buttocks. And the diagnosis, the gold standard for diagnosis is pelvic venogram with a turntable technique. That is, you have to patient, make the patient an anti trendenberg cushion and diagnose the dilated veins within the parametrium. A non-invasive method is MR venogram. Now, we usually diagnose it in MR venogram. And ultrasound is not very useful. Ultrasound just shows dilated veins with parametrial congestion. So the diagnosis is usually when abnormal uh, ovarian veins are detected in ultrasound or uh, MR, which should be more than 10 mm in diameter. There should be presence of ovarian vein reflex, uterine venous engorgement. And the characteristic finding is the pelvic veins are usually enlarged and they cross the midline and communicate with the opposite side. So this is the diagnostic criteria. The ovarian veins should be more than 10 mm. There should be ovarian vein reflex, uterine venous engorgement and filling of pelvic veins across the midline. So this is a transvaginal ultrasound image which shows dilated prominent veins within the pelvis. And this is the MR venogram which is showing uh, dilated prominent venous channels that crosses the midline and the enlarged prominent gonadal veins which are more than 10 mm. So the treatment options for these women are that these symptoms are usually very uh, disturbing for the uh, patients. So they usually end up undergoing hysterectomy or surgical vein ligation which has a very high operative mortality and morbidity. So the minimally invasive procedure that we offer is ovarian vein embolization. So ovarian vein embolization is a minimally invasive treatment option, which you can do as an outpatient service. It has a high technical success and with low side effects. And technical success rate is around 89 to 97%. What we use is that we go into the ovarian veins through, uh, through, with, through the jugular approach and we uh, identify the ovarian vein and then we inject uh, we thrombose the vein with the help of coils or sclerosins. It can use either, either selectively or you can use combined sclerosin and coils. And 75 to 80% of the veins, they get shrunk and obliterated within six months of this procedure. So this is a case of a 45-year-old lady with previous two LSCS who presented with low backache and irregular cycles and ultrasound was showing parametrial congestion with no significant pelvic pathology. She didn't have any fibroids or anything, but she just had dilated veins in the parametrium. You can see that on the left side, the veins are very engorged with uh, um, contrast filling. And this is MR, dynamic enhanced MR venogram, which is showing the early arterial, late arterial, and early venous phase. In the early venous phase, we see that the long gonadal vein on the left side is prominent. As you know, the right gonadal vein drains into the inferior vena cava, and the left gonadal vein drains into the left renal vein. So she had more prominent symptoms on the left side. I mean, she had a more prominent vein on the left side compared to right. So what we did is that we went, uh, we went through the femoral vein, we entered the renal vein, and from the renal vein, we entered the gonadal vein on the left side, and we identified the pathology on the left parametral region, and we embolized with coils. 
So this is a study that uh, compared ovarian vein embolization with hysterectomy and unilateral oophorectomy for chronic pelvic pain. The study incorporated 106 patients who had failed medical treatment. After a follow-up of about 32 months, ovarian vein embolization was significantly more effective in reducing pelvic pain. And this treatment is very safe and well tolerated by most of the women. So this is a 35-year-old woman with pelvic congestion syndrome uh, with chronic pelvic pain. Again, you see the left side of gonadal vein, which is dilated, and it was successfully embolized with coils. So usually we start coiling from the level of the inguinal ligament, and you have to coil up to the level of the last tributary. Or the uh, last tributary till that level, you have to coil. If you miss out any tributaries, the symptoms usually recur, and you should not coil at the level of the renal vein because the coil tends to get migrated. Now, the last technique, uh, which is uh, for assisted reproduction, is fallopian tube recanalization. And fallopian tube blocks accounts for one-third of the cases of infertility in our country, and usually plugs of amorphous material that blocks the corner of the tubes. And hysterosalpingography and selective wiring of the tube may aid in recanalization and subsequent fertility. And fallopian tube block accounts for 30% of the women with infertility and usually seen between 25 and 35 years of age group. FTR is a non-surgical method of tubal recanalization. It is completely scarless, bloodless, and painless. The procedure just takes about 20 to 30 minutes time and it's highly cost-effective. So these are the parts of the fallopian tube. You have the interstitial, isthmic, ampullary, and infundibular portion. The fallopian tube is usually situated in the upper part of the broad ligament. It is around 10 to 12 centimeters long and around three to five mm in width. So the corneal block with amorphous plugs are usually the most common cause of infertility and they can be opened up with the help of a wire. However, if the patient had any previous surgery or ruptured ectopic, or if it's a fimbrial block, we were not able to help. And what the function of the fallopian tube is to transport the ovum, and it is a site of fertilization. And the causes of fallopian tube block are usually due to pelvic inflammatory disease, tuberculosis, prior endometriosis, prior tubal surgery, or previous ectopic pregnancy. And what are the prerequisites for performing a fallopian tube uh, recanalization? It's usually performed on the 8 to 10 day of the cycle so that uh, you, 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 uh, you know that the patient will not be pregnant at this time. And also the chances of uh, blood, uh, endometrial blood products to be spilled into the peritoneal cavity is very less. And a uterine pregnancy test is mandatory before the procedure to rule out pregnancy. And the patient should also have a high vaginal swab, which should be negative to rule out infection. And the pre-procedure HSG and pelvic ultrasound is essential. And the procedure can be done under local, uh, like low, uh, under procedural sedation with midazolam or lorazepam. And the consent for cervical dilatation and contrast injection should be obtained. We use a very small sheet to cannulate the cervix, which is a four French or five French sheet. But some women, they have a very high, very tight cervical stenosis that has to be dilated by the gynecologist with Hegar dilators. If the woman is very anxious, she may have to, the procedure have to be done under general anesthesia. So the contraindication for procedure is if the patient has a distal block. If it's a fallopian, uh, if it's a fimbrial block, we may not be able to open up with the tube wire. Active pelvic infection is a contraindication. Ectopic pregnancy is another contraindication. And, uh, uh, and if the patient had a prior tubal surgery, tubectomy or ruptured ectopic, then the tubes, the anatomy of the tubes is not normal. In that cases, we may create a false track and we may not be successful in doing the recanalization. So these are the materials that we do for use of fallopian tube recanalization. We use a five French or four French vascular sheet. We have a plastic catheter. This is a custom-made plastic catheter for cannulating the fallopian tube. We use a 018 or 035 hydrophilic guide wire. We use non-ionic contrast. And the routine naganic instruments like a scospeculum, Hegar dilators, and valsalum. So technique, the patient is placed in the dorsal portion or the lithotomy portion, and she's sedated with the help of buscopan or lorazepam. And uh, buscopan is given to prevent inherent uterine contraction. So the most common uh, false negative or uh, false negative uh, cause for uh, bilateral tubal block is tubal spasm. So you have to make the patient, uh, if the patient is very anxious, the chances of tubal spasm are very high. So once the tubal spasm open up, the tube is actually patent. I can see the filling of, uh, spillage of contrast into the peritoneum. If it is not tubal spasm, then you have to cannulate and then pass a wire and open the stenosis. So I told you if, it, if there's a very tight cervical stenosis and you're not able to pass the forefront sheet, you need to dilate the cervix with the help of Hegar dilators. So you, have, you perform an initial hysterosalpingography to identify the location of the tubal ostium and the, whether the tubes are actually patent or not. A catheter is placed transcervically into the tubal ostium. Contrast material is injected into the tubes to, at, at, uh, to assess the patency and to assess for the spillage of contrast into the peritoneum. 
So once the tubal block is confirmed, you pass a wire and then you try to open it and then you flush with saline to make, uh, to completely flush these uh, debris from the tube. So this is how we do it. I cannulated the cervix and I passed a catheter into the cornua and then you have passed a guide wire across the length of the fallopian tube and we have opened the tube, which is on the left side. So the results are very promising. The pregnancy rates after the procedure is very high, around 30% uh, average. Spontaneous conception has occurred in 22% of the women following uh, FTR. The ovarian radiation low, low dose after this procedure is very minimal because the time taken for this is just 20 minutes. So it's just less than one rad. Procedure is successful for proximal tubal occlusion. As I told you, for distal tubal occlusion, it is not, uh, the success rates are very less. The complications can occur after this procedure is flaring up of the pelvic inflammations. You can have bleeding after the procedure, contrast reactions, pelvic cramps, and tubal perforation is very less, which is less than 1%. Tubal perforation is more common if she had any prior tubal surgery. So this is a 34-year-old woman with uh, secondary infertility with no tubal surgery. Histostapingogram was done, which showed a left-sided tubal block, and she had no active pelvic infection. So you can see the right tube is patent with the spillage of contrast, and the left, left tube is blocked. And we have, after the FTR, you can see that the left tube has nicely opened up with good spillage of contrast into the peritoneal cavity. So coming to the last part of the topic, which is high intensity focused ultrasound. This is a non-invasive therapy that uses focused ultrasound waves uh, to ablate the fibroids. What uh, the property of ultrasound is that if you concentrate high energy ultrasound to a, for a particular area for a long period of time, it can lead to generation of heat and heat can cause coagulation necrosis of tissues. So high intensity focus ultrasound focuses the tissues, uh, generate heat energy that causes coagulation, necrosis and heat shock in tissues. And it ultrasound can raise the temperature of tissues by 70 to 80 degrees. And the temperature is uh, proportionate to the time, which is the pulse duration as well as the pulse repetition rate. And uh, multiple sonications are required to ablate a large area of the fibroid. So this is a novel method of treating fibroids. However, this is not available in all centers and it is really expensive. The equipment is usually MR compatible and the procedure is done on MR guidance. So this is how you select the patient for uh, HIFU or high intensity focused ultrasound. Inclusion criteria is uh, women with known symptomatic uterine fibroids. The age of the patient should be 18 to 59 years. She should have a BMI of less than 35 because obese women, what happens is that the fibroids are very deep and the ultrasound is not able to focus properly. And it is not suitable for young women. The women has to be in the peri perimenopausal age group. And the symptom severity score should be more than 30. And the pap smear should be negative. And it should have a dominant myoma on the anterior wall. If it's, if it's a posterior myoma, you cannot be able to focus the ultrasound beam properly. So anterior myomas are commonly treated by this method. Exclusion criteria is uh, associated pregnancy or the patient desires to become pregnant, then this, uh, uh, this treatment modality is contraindicated. Any serious systemic illness, prior pelvic radiation or scarring in which the uh, uterine anatomy is disturbed, and general contraindications to MRI, like if the patient is having pacemaker, con uh, any incompatible uh, stents or cardiac devices, uh, cochlear implants, insulin pumps, or if generally the patient is claustrophobic and cannot lie in the MR machine for the long period of time. Calcified uterus are a contraindication. Calcified uterine fibroids are a contraindication because the temperature cannot be controlled. It, it, it can lead to a lot of uh, unnecessary burns. And intra-abdominal surgical clips are a contraindication because the clips can also take up ultrasound energy and get heated. So there is not much of a patient choice here. If the patient is having an anterior wall fibroid and if the patient is very thin, then only you can go for this procedure. And it is usually done under sedation and this takes a very long time. It usually takes about one to two hours and the patient should be completely immobile. The patient should not move when she's placed in the MR machine and the bladder must be empty. So uh, MR, high intensity focused ultrasound is usually done MR guided, but it can also be done for ultrasound guided. Ultrasound guided in the sense it is transvaginal ultrasound. So this is a basic principle. You have the patient is, uh, you have a coupling gel with a high intensity ultrasound transducer, which is placed on the patient's abdomen and ultrasound beams are transmitted into the patient's abdomen into the focal part of the tumor. And it is uh, depending upon the pulse duration and the pulse repetition, the tumor usually have a high, uh, the temperature inside the tumor increases and it causes coagulated necrosis of the tissue. So the ultrasound beam that passes through the coupling medium, the skin, subcutaneous fat, muscle, and then enter the tumor. 
So this is how the procedure is done. The patient is placed in the prone position in the MR scanner and the ultrasound transducer is placed on the MR table with the coupling gel and the patient is positioned over the transducer. The pelvis, pelvic area is concentrated and the pelvic coil is placed on the patient. And the patient should be completely still because the uh, ultrasound beams are kind of focused onto the particular area of the fibroid which you see in the MR scanner. But the procedure takes a very long period of time. It usually takes about one to two hours and multiple sittings are usually required to treat all the fibroids. And the procedure is re relatively expensive also. So these are the advantages of HIFU. It is very minimally invasive. As I told you, all procedures, scarless, bed, less painless, less hospital stay, and it does not use any ionizing radiation. However, the disadvantage is that it is a high cost and the patient has to be counseled that she has to be lying still in the MR machine for a long period of time. Multiple sessions are required. They can be non-target sonication and incomplete destruction because if it's a very irregularly shaped fibroid and you're not, you're just treating one part of the lesion properly, the whole tumor will not get ablated. And not all fibroids can be treated with the HIFU. It has to be an anterior wall fibroid. And if the fibroid is in some weird location that you cannot access, then this procedure is not very effective. So this is a patient who had a large anterior wall fibroid. This is an ideal candidate, a large anterior wall fibroid, which is very close to the anterior abdominal wall. She underwent HIFU and then follow up, you can see that the fibroid is not enhancing. It has completely degenerated and become cystic. So this is what you expect after any kind of embolization or interventional radiology procedures. You should see that the fibroid should sink in size to less than 50% of the pre-procedure volume, and it should, not, it should be completely cystic with no enhancement. So this is another patient who underwent the ultrasound-guided HIFU. You can see there is a large cervical fibroid, and after HIFU, you can see that the cervical fibroid has reduced in size. So complications of HIFU are very less. Uh, they can cause skin burns. They can cause inflammation of the subcutaneous and epidermal fat. And it can cause leg paresthesia due to irritation of the nerve because the patient is lying prone for about one to two period of time, uh, one to two hours period of time. They can have deep pain thrombosis and intestinal perforation is extremely rare. So coming to the clinical scenario that we first discussed at the beginning of the topic, that is a 16-year-old girl diagnosed with myelodysplastic syndrome, admitted for bone marrow transplant, and she developed... Uh, Menorrhagia, which was severe during induction course of chemotherapy. Now the patient is going for hypovolemic shock. Now I hope you all understood the importance of interventional radiology. This patient was successfully managed with uterine artery embolization. So being the pediatric age group, we have done cases, similar cases for patients with idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura. And we had one patient with dengue hemorrhagic shock syndrome with menorrhagia, which was very severe. And the patient successfully underwent control of bleeding with uterine artery embolization. So I will show you a few quick cases, interesting cases that we have done. The first is a 34-year-old unmarried female who's a known case of SLE. And she's been on treatment for corticosteroids for a long period of time. And whenever she has low platelets, she develops severe menorrhagia and ultrasound was showing, ultrasound and MRI was done, which shows multiple small intramural fibroids. And because the patient was on corticosteroids for a long period of time, she had following a severe trivial trauma, she had a hip fracture and she underwent a hip surgery long back and due to that she was refusing another surgery for this uterus so this is her MR image which showed a small anterior wall fibroid and she underwent a successful uterine fibroid embolization you can see this is the right side the pre-embolization post-embolization and this is the left side you can see the uterus vessels and post-embolization all the vessels are blocked now this is another interesting case she's a 26 year old migraine worker and she was speaking a foreign language that we didn't understand at all. And she had come all the way from this faraway place for severe intermittent bleeding. And she says that she had, uh, we don't know how many children she had. She says that she had a history of multiple DNCs. And just prior to coming here, she had some kind of surgery. We don't know whether it's a cesarean or what. Uh, we were not able to communicate properly with the patient. And she was taken up for a CT scan, which showed a very large mass in the pelvis an abnormal thick enhancement. We didn't know what it was. We, and it was showing active contrast extravasation also. So she was taken up for emergency and geography. And geography showed that there's abnormal vessels and we identified these as placental vessels. So she had a cesarean and the placental tissue was left inside and the surgeons didn't know what it was. So we successfully embolized this patient with PVA particles and the bleeding stopped. Next is a 21-year-old unmarried female who sustained RTA. This is another case that we have done. She is a 21-year-old. She was pylon riding with someone. 
and she met with a very uh, high velocity road traffic accident. She had multiple fractures of the pelvic bones and she had uterine laceration with bleeding from the anterior division of internal iliac artery. So in CT, she had this uh, implants that were external fixators of the pelvis, which were placed. And you can see the bleeding from the anterior division of internal iliac artery. There was contrast extravasation. She was in hypovolemic shock. She had a cardiac arrest and then she was resuscitated in the ER and then shifted to the cath lab. And we saw this contrast extravasation from the anterior division. You can see the vessels are very pencil thin here because of the hypovolemic and sympathetic stimulation. And we successfully embolized this vessel with the help of coils. There's another 32 year old female with diabetes mellitus and macrosomia status post cesarean. She developed a drop in hemoglobin with hypotension. So she had a very difficult labor and she had a very big baby. And the last moment they took up for cesarean section. She was completely fine after the cesarean, but in the post-operative period within 24 hours, she developed severe lower abdominal distension along with drop in hemoglobin. So she underwent a CT scan, which showed a collection in the rectus sheet, which is called a rectus sheet hematoma. And there was active extravasation from the right inferior epigastric artery. So what we did is we selectively cannulated the right inferior epigastric artery. We found the bleeding vessel and we coiled and we saved the life. So this is the last word coming to the end of this whole session that I have to give is that interval, interventional radiology can offer several minimally invasive procedures to improve the life of the women. Some of these can be life-saving and these procedures are used to treat excessive menstrual bleeding, chronic pelvic pain, uh, and also in treatment of infertility, fibroids, etc. So the most important thing is awareness is crucial and there should be a good relationship between the gynec and the radiology department and a close relationship between our, our departments can benefit your patients. And thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Uh, Niriksha, ma'am? Yes, yes. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you, sir, for that elaborated and very helpful talk. Uh, this particular topic is very less touched upon and very less is known to us, especially radiologists. Thank you, Rajesh, sir, very much for that wonderful talk. It is really beneficial for us and the specifics that we were not aware of and even the postgraduates are going to get benef benefited by it. Thanks a lot again, sir. Uh, I thank uh, Dr. Prasanna Kumar, sir, for chairing our session today, despite of his busy schedule, taking his time off and being here for this talk. And I thank our HOD, Dr. Raghurat, sir, and the entire department of Shema, all the PGs and staff who has helped in this uh, session to take place. Our dean and uh, Nita University staff for giving us this opportunity to conduct these webinar series, which are really helpful for the uh, in the academic perspective of the postgraduates and also for all the staff. It's been very helpful. I thank our IT department and uh, for the links of this YouTube and this uh, Zoom meeting link. And I also thank all these delegates who have been, attended the session and been benefited by it. I thank everyone for your time. Have a nice weekend. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you for giving the opportunity to chair the session. And I must congratulate uh, the entire radiology department, uh, headed by Dr. Raghuraj, uh, for this wonderful program. And thank you, Dr. Rajesh Venunath, for taking us through the entire spectrum of uh, this cutting edge uh, interventional radiology procedures. And I'm sure uh, all of us, I at least uh, learned a couple of new things about um, IR. So I hope all our junior and senior colleagues have learned something today. Uh, thank you, Niriksha, and thank you, Dr. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Prasanna, sir, if you have any questions, can just uh, pass it across to the speaker. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. I'll, uh, I just had a, uh, I actually uh, learned a new thing because uh, most of the times in um, adherent placenta, usually the interventional radiologists are called when the patient is really sick or, uh, uh, you know, not very stable. But uh, I feel uh, in every case, uh, this is just an observation. I totally agree with uh, Dr. Rajesh that we should... Uh, uh, 
actively look for this condition, meaning those who have uh, pre previous scars, scarred uterus or uh, multipara and then do MRI and uh, with the high index of suspicion, I think we should keep the interventional radiology team ready so that uh, unnecessary hysterectomies are avoided and the patient's life can be saved. And I'm sure in future, uh, with the economies of scale, with the more uh, facilities coming up, providing uh, intervention radiologists and more trained personnel, I think the cost also may come down and uh, many, many lives can be saved due to uh, obstetrical hemorrhage. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rajesh. And uh, thank you, Dr. Raguraj. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you uh, all. It was a wonderful session. So uh, let us wind up the session. Ma'am, shall we yes, wind yes. up the session? Yes, yes, sure. Thank you, Rajesh, sir, once again. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice weekend.